You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Folks, welcome back to the Shoe In Show. Hope you're having a lovely day from wherever you are around the world listening to Shoe Radio. Yeah, you're, you're in, you might be in your car, you might be on the train, might you might be, be in on a one plane. of those e-scooters. Might be in a factory. The, in a factory, indeed. We have... We, I'm always surprised when we when we go around and someone's like, oh, I listen to Shoe and Show. And I'm like, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. But they do. They do. Yeah, it's shock. It's shocking that people listen to us talk about footwear. I know. <laughs> That's why we need guests. Exactly <laughs> to right. To listen to them. Exactly right. Jasmine, how are you doing? Great. Great. I'm happy to be back for another episode. Yeah, <laughs> us too. So there's a lot happening in our footwear industry. A lot, you know, obviously with politics and trade and... We've talked a lot recently about the retail shifts uh, and changes taking place, but there's also an awful lot taking place inside factories. Um, There's constantly uh, challenges at factories, but also there's a lot of good work being done to help uh, update our processes in factories, provide more um, upskills for the workers there, looking at different workflow and processes. Um, and I'm excited to uh, invite back our friend Jose Suarez from Impactiva, who has been a guest on the show before, to kind of talk about some of the stuff they're seeing in factories and the work they're doing. Jose, it's nice to see you again, my friend. Hey, guys. Hi, Andy. Hi, Matt. Welcome back to the show. Nice, nice to be back. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, when we talk about the factories, you know, we talk about production issues. Um, we the industry's been talking about the power of data for years now. Um, all kinds of data points at the factory level to to help them think they c- they can make shoes more effectively, efficiently, better time management. Um, so, from your perspective at the factory level, what role does the data play when we talk about production? Yeah, there was a guy who is one of the first lean as an L-E-A-N, which is the elimination of eight types of waste that happen in any process. In this case, we're talking about footwear manufacturing. And Deming said that if you, you can't fix what you don't measure. And um, so we, we have a big void in our industry that the factories, I would say more than 98% of the factories are only focused, the ownership, the top management, middle management, and even the artisans in, in our new company, Vaiso, which is a shop floor live control system, we talk about um, artisans, meaning the workers, operators, employees on the production line. And uh, they are only focused on output. You know, how many shoes got put in master cartons that day and did we meet the X factory date? And unfortunately, we believe, well, it's not we, it's the retailers' brands and pushed by the consumers of today's world that you need to transform yourself. And the only way to do that is to buy, by gathering data. But that's not enough. Then you have to know what to do with the data. And that's what we're doing on Vaisal. Yeah, so talk more about that. Is that like, when you say collect more data, is that like empowering the line worker to look at what they're doing and and plug information in or input into to a system so that somebody can have the analytics to figure out where the bottlenecks are? Is that what we're talking about? Well, it's, it's how do you uh, get real-time data down to the each workstation so that um, not only the artisan, but also the supervisors, middle management, quality teams, et cetera, can take immediate action and how do we build that culture of immediate action which is missing in our industry and and that's what we're doing with Viaso by um, placing a device a tablet or a phone on every workstation we are gamifying the shop floor to make work interesting for the artisans and therefore we engage them not only in arms and legs which is what we've always been doing but also engage them in, in mind, using their creativity for problem solving and continuous improvement, and also their hearts, um, their energy, because 
they get immediate feedback on how well they're doing. It's amazing. And the first factory that we've installed, the feedback we're getting is, thank you. Could we even have more? Even when we make mistakes in, for example, clicking on a defect on a tablet, we'd like to know that we made a mistake. So can we close the loop? So it's, it's really cool. It's, people have been working in a void, and that goes all the way to top management and all the way to the leading retailers and brands of the world because they cannot set targets for improvement of productivity, quality, and most important, speed, because today it's all about speed. Right. It's the difference between gross and net margin retail, and they have no visibility to be able to set those parameters because the factories, as you well said, I mean, they're not used to using data and data for gathering metrics and then to establish continuous improvement programs. And that's what we're trying to do with Vice. So, Jose, it sounds like you're doing a, a lot around the culture. And, you know, we've talked a lot and we've seen a lot about innovations that are promising to increase efficiency, to help the industry catch up with consumer expectations, which are ch- changing dramatically. We've looked at 3D printing. We've looked at um, we've looked at sampling. We've looked at all kinds of different di- – the digitization of the supply chain, if you will. But that's a lot of stuff that you can fix through technology. How much of it can is actually about the culture? Uh, to us, it's 70, 80 percent about the culture. So how do you build a continuous improvement culture? We talked about data. But then how do you build in, and that's what we are successfully doing. You know, we've done it in Impactiva for almost seven years with our consulting practice and in process optimization, lean transformation of factories in Laos, Portugal, Egypt, Vietnam, China, Indonesia, et cetera. So what we've done is take what we've, what we've learned and we're applying it to the um platform, Shop for Live Control platform, and that is how do we get people, especially middle management, to start um, executing behaviors that become habits that bring about the values of accountability, discipline, and transparency. And you are able to do that with software. Um, There's a lot of things like structured meetings and having agendas for the meeting and creating action items out of the meetings and creating projects. And all of that shows up on your dashboards with due dates. And if you don't hit your due dates, your your leader all the way up to the general manager or factory can see how many action items, how many projects, and what percentage are being completed on time. Because when you switch shift, and it, it's not only a factory, it can be an office environment, it could be a warehouse, anything. If you don't work around action items and projects, and all of those are executed within a reasonable deadline, you don't continue to improve. So it's not only gathering the data and then providing minute-by-minute escalations and root cause and corrective action plan, which we also do, but how do you embed more sophisticated um, behavior and habit-changing systems or processes that bring about, at the end, a culture of continuous improvement? And this is where everybody fails, and this is the big... um, a big change that we're bringing to the industry with the platform. So it's not only real-time data, real-time corrections, but also permanent corrections in behavior, habits, values, and culture. Mm. Uh, you know, we, you know, and we know that production is shifting all over the place at this point. Um, a lot of it is due to the new tariffs that are being placed on uh, products from China, but also just typical diversification. Of production by brands to to lessen their risks, um, you know, being concentrated in one area. So, you know, obviously Vietnam is picking up a lot of that. We see a little bit of growth in Bangladesh, some in Cambodia. So, you know, there's some increasing production in Ethiopia and Mexico. Um, so, as people people are faced with these new tariffs, are looking elsewhere. And then I, I just have a question because you guys work on a global scale. You know, how does this work with with quality control as people start to look elsewhere. I, I think in some sense we've been very blessed to have been in China for so long because the quality is obviously quite good. The artisanship is quite good. Um, the defects are very low there. They, they take a lot of pride in the details. Um, but as you, as you go elsewhere, it creates other challenges around quality. So, you know, we talk about direct to consumer models or, or changing things, um, you know, but when, but when we talk also about like quality control issues within the factory, you know, what changes need to occur in order to 
you know, as we see this proliferation take place of sourcing, what what needs to change to make sure that that quality remains very high for the brand and for the consumer? You know, we just um, finalized a survey with one of the leading uh, media um, in the industry, and it was impressive to see that 60% of the professionals who were surveyed in operations and sourcing said their biggest issue is how to improve quality. And obviously what you just explained, imagine even if in China we have issues on a day-to-day basis, right. imagine going to Ethiopia or Myanmar or Mexico, um, where the artisans, uh, and, and this is true in China, because if you go in and survey any factory and you take 250 artisans, the quality control, um, we call them guardians, that are at the end of every department, and you give them a test on what is the defect and you show them pictures, the scores they get are abysmal. But now go to something, and these are skilled artisans that have been working in the industry for years. Now go to a place like Myanmar, Mexico, or Egypt and hire new people. It is one of the biggest gaps that exists mm. in the industry. Mm-hmm. So that's what we've done in Vias. So we've, we've cataloged 453 defects that exist in the industry, plus pictures on them. And we are now going to release um, shortly an e-learning course that's going to be free for the artisans of the industry where they can go in and learn the world of defects. That's the second most um, in the survey. That was the second most desperate need is 40-something percent of the professionals um, replied that the knowledge of what is a defect is their biggest concern. And it, and it gets... Um, you know, it gets wor- even worse, like you said, when you start moving out of countries that have been been in producing shoes for us for a long, long time. Yeah, and it sounds like what you're trying to do is is you're trying to figure out how to stop those defects from getting further down the line and costing more and more money. I mean, if you can pin it, if you can pinpoint where the troubles are and train those people up, that means they're not passing down the defects where more materials added and the process keeps going, and you only catch it at the very end of the process. Yeah. Yeah, or even worse, when it gets to the United States or Europe right. or wherever it's right. ending up, right? So, yes, this is this is about catching, doing it right from the start, right? And, um, and starting to build a culture of zero defects. And the only way you can do that, when I go back to the artisans, is by giving them a tool so that they can real-time know, and this is why we call gamifying the shot floor, is that I personally, if I'm doing cementing and I'm on workstation 120, or I'm roughing and you're on board station 121 cementing, how do you control the defects that I'm generating so that we can turn every single artisan to a quality control guardian so that ultimately when the, when the whole purchase order or work order gets produced, it is produced right from the start at a very high quality and it doesn't get rejected and doesn't end up as a claim um, from a retailer anywhere in the world. And this is the huge paradigm shift. There's a lot of platforms out there that are launching or have launched, excuse me, platforms, and we call them policing the policemen because they're making the final quality control, optimizing the work of the final quality control inspector. But um, the retailers and brands that we're going around speaking understand that they need data to understand where the problems are, but that these platforms don't ultimately solve the problem because the only way you solve the problem is that you just said it, Andy. At the moment it happens, one sword station downstream, not when 3,000, 10,000, or 25,000 pairs of shoes are sitting in a factory warehouse. Jose, or Jose, one of the things that we, you talked about a paradigm shift, and I think that when we think about just the tariffs and the movement of goods and the movement of sourcing, the diversification of sourcing, and the challenges that come with that, you have to lay on top of that um, smaller runs based on consumer demands shorter cycle times and better quality so it's like it seems like all these things that don't normally coexist diversification of sourcing meaning better quality and shorter cycle times can we can we have all this simultaneously where something's got to give i think as we as we expand the horizons of footwear production globally but also our our consumers are expecting these smaller runs these shorter cycle times this speed to market mentality and and ultimately better quality i don't think we can kind of provide all, all those things am i wrong well no um you know when 
Polaris shut down its last factory in North America in 2003, and Bill Blay, who is, is working on Vias for our new company, tells me that without automation, they were able to produce a zillion short runs, because you can imagine, this is 2003, um, and they were producing the small runs, a lot of SKUs, without any robotics, they were producing two pairs per artisan per hour. And in non-athletic footwear today in Asia, we're about 0.5. So it's only a first, it's recognizing that you have a long way to go to improve, which is a big problem in our industry. Factory owners have been making a lot of money for a long time with low-cost labor, and they think they're doing well. But that's the paradigm shift that you are you describe with the the increasing consumer needs. The consumer wants quality because it's receiving more and more product at home. They want it yesterday because it's not. If if they don't get something quickly, it's not fashion. It's not fresh. And so speed. And then because they are co-designing now, it's a pull versus a push system. And Inditex is the best example of a pull system and how to use supply chain for a huge competitive advantage. So all that together with um, globalization and tariffs and the fact that 60% of non-plastic, non-rubber shoes are still produced in China, there's 6 million artisans producing shoes in China, and we don't have a place to go produce that. I mean, all the countries you mentioned, how many, 100,000, half a million, a million people? Vietnam, which is the second largest country, is talking about adding two and a half million for both apparel and footwear to their um, to the number of people in the industry. I think it's in five years or four years. So the second largest source, including apparel, which is trying to shift into Vietnam also, is freeing up 2.5 million people. How can we shift footwear out of there? The only way is we have to become um, industrial manufacturers, just like the auto and electronic industry. And that's what we're trying to do with ISO, give um, factory owners and top management a simple digital tool, simple in the user interface and, and the way to, to um, apply it on the shop floor, but complex because of the breadth and depth of the solution. We think that's the only way to meet the consumer's demands of speed, quality, and and keeping costs down. Yes. And so I do believe you can do it. I mean, obviously, when you're producing one run one entire day versus 10 SKUs, it does require you to get quick change over times. But if you focus your attention, you can bring a change over time from one hour to 50 minutes to 30 minutes to 22, down to 10 and 5. And it's, it's only about what you focus. And this is the big problem we have. The consumer is demanding, the retail and brand understands that we have a problem, but there's a big wall still with our factory owners and leadership team. And that's the wall we have to bring down so that they understand the pain that the consumer has and that we need to transform and become industrial manufacturers of shoes because otherwise we're not going to meet the demands ever-increasing demands of our consumers. Well, and Jose, we talk about the tariffs being a huge, I mean, the tariff, the tariffs have just been, have dominated everything that we've talked about. And if everything stands, um, you know, we're going to be paying significantly more than we already pay. We already pay about $3 billion a year, and that's going to go up significantly. And that's pushing sourcing around, as we've already talked about. But for those who are staying behind, and just think about the added costs, whether you are moving or not, there are going to be added costs in the supply chain. It seems really difficult, or it, I, I, will, I guess I'll say it this way. It, it will be, um, I think it'll be very tempting not to focus on on these issues that we've talked about with the artisans and with continuous improvement when there's more costs and trying to figure out who, who takes on those costs. And, and when we go to our members and we talk about a variety of different initiatives, whether it's sustainability or social compliance, it's all an important aspect of the equation for which they're assessing their factories and engaging with their factories. But, you know, let's be honest, it's not the, it's not always the number one issue. It's costs usually in delivery. Um, how how in this environment are the factories that you're working with kind of taking this on, and how are they approaching it? Babe? Just because it just seems like the tariffs are sucking the oxygen out of the out of the room in so many ways. Yeah, I, I think people have to realize that in four, 
if you have six million artisans in China, you cannot move that anywhere anytime soon. So if I was running the the operation sourcing of a major retailing brand, my first focus is how do I turn all my factories through lean transformation or uh, a shop floor left control system like Baeso so that I can improve, significantly improve not only productivity and quality and build a uh, culture of zero defects, but also speed. Uh, how can I get my manufacturing from the time I get a purchase order? How can I get the average lead time from some some companies are still buying 90 days, 60, you know, it has to drop to 60, 50, 45, 40. Ultimately, people are trying to hit 30, 35 days. And I totally agree with you, Matt. Everybody is in freeze frame. I remember uh, uh, growing up with the Dick Tracy cartoons where he'd say, you know, I don't remember what the expression, but everything froze. That's where it is. Right. And it's not, there, there isn't a solution. I mean, we're going to pay more for shoes. And so the only way to do it is take your factory base and make them, you know. It's sad that 16 years ago in the last Clara's factory was at two pairs per operator per hour, and we're still at 0.5. There is so much money to be squeezed. If you take any shoe, a $10 shoe with a third labor, which is $3.50, if you put yourself to it, in three years, you can take $1.65 out of the cost and at the same time improve quality and at the same time reduce your change over time so that you can produce 10 SKUs or 10 work orders on one production line in a day without skipping a beat. But that requires the retailer and brand to push and literally to the point of, you know, demanding this from the factories. And we're like, the retailers and brands want to own a factory, but they don't want to push the factory to transformation. The athletic brands are the best at doing this, and they've been working on improvement, lean, continuous improvement. But even they are, are hitting a wall as to the additional improvements. So if the retail and brands don't put uh, almost a gun to the factory's heads, and as for the transformation, our industry is going to suffer a lot. We're going to see a lot more bankruptcies because if you don't fix your supply chain, you can do everything on the front end. But if you don't fix your supply chain, um, I predict that you, people are not going to exist this four, five, six, eight years down the road. You've got to be working on both ends of the equation is what we feel. It's not only me. I mean, we have Ed Gribben on board and Kirk Cavanaugh is on board and Bias, so, and we all feel the same way. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, eventually the consumer sees it, right? It's, it's great to have an in-store experience or a great website, but if the product's not showing up in the amount of time they expect it and in the quality they expect it, then they're not going to shop from you again. So, um, yep. it's a, you know, Jose, it's always good to talk to you guys because you're in the factories and seeing what's happening and see the, the changes taking place and excited about this new gamification tool that you're you're rolling out, and uh, you know, I just want to take a minute and just say thanks to Impactiva for their continued support of FDRA um, in 2019 and and going into 2020, um, helping us put on our events and and helping a lot of our uh, members uh, address these quality issues and these these upskill issues uh, inside the factories. Um, you guys are doing some great work around the world, so thanks for that. Um, and at at this point, I think we will bring in Jasmine. To do one of her famous segments for us to freshen up our our uh, fashion. So what are we doing, Thank, Jasmine? Thanks, Andy. Um, so we're gonna do our uh, what you got, what you get. Oh, okay. Um, and that's our segment where we say what we have on our feet currently and what we're thinking about getting. So I have on my feet um, our Reebok, um, my Reebok Classics again, okay. um, the tan pair, and I think. Um, Jordan had like a satin Air Force Ones uh, for women's only, um, and it's like a satin red, black, and white Air Force One. So I missed the opportunity when they were first released, but I hope I can find them online. So that is what I'm getting. Fingers crossed. Right on. Yes. Uh, I've got on Sperry's today. The weather outside is a little bit rainy. Um, I think I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to buy some winter boots. I have not done research yet, but I'm gonna have to buy some winter boots. I think it's time to to invest in something maybe i'll yeah. go to columbia sportswear or something yeah. like that mm-hmm. um to see what they've got for for cold weather and what about you matt 
I am wearing some Doc Martens. I got some Doc Martin boots on that are have like a canvas. They have the military look. They're kind of kind of a dark blue canvas. Nice upper, which is kind of unique for Doc Martens. Mm-hmm. But they also Doc Martens has a slew of low top shoes, which I wasn't even mm-hmm. aware of till recently. So I think I'm going to pick up some low top Doc yes. Martin shoes so Those I can nice. hit the hit the summer, the springtime, in, in style. Yes, I agree. What about you, Jose? What do you have on your feet now? My uh, Colhan leather sneakers. Awesome. Super comfy. Yeah, I love Colhan sneakers. And what are you thinking about getting? Uh, huh. Well, I'm down here in Miami. So some good sandals while you guys freeze up yes. there. Yes. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> Super jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right. You want me to ask Mr. German Shepherd who's sitting beside me? <laughs> it, he's always barefoot. <laughs> <laughs> Jose, thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Folks, thank you for listening to Shoe and Show, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear. Uh, if you would like to uh, suggest topics we have on our show, please drop us a line. Uh, you can fill that out uh, on our contact form at shoeandshow.com. Also, you can find all our past episodes. We've got about 200 episodes on there. And something new that we're adding, um, if you go down to the very bottom of the page, there is a, um, a little voice icon you can click that button and actually send us an audio message to ask us a question on air if you're having issues challenges we might do a a help desk segment if we get enough um so that'd be very cool uh and as always please uh make sure you tell your friends and family about us they love shoes they'll love this show and until next time shoe in show is out shoe in has been brought to you by the fdra the footwear industries association focused on retail trade politics and fashion helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.